My name, Aaron Kinate. So um, I am the Mary Ella King uh, Fellowship recipient, and part of that uh, requirement is that you must be an indigenous person of the Southwest. So with respect to my culture, uh, I'll introduce myself in the Navajo way. Yat eh she Aaron Kinate inishia dinenishle. Do Belagana Nishle, Trodicini da Shinale, Akut Ego Dinishle. So I just said that on my mother's side, I'm American. On my father's side, I'm Pueblo. And my paternal grandfather is Navajo. Navajo, he's from the Bitter Water people. And this is how I am, Dine. But in our American society and our government, this is how I'm DNA. This is uh, my certificate of Indian blood, census number 438484. So um, it's a little bit confusing for me at times, being an American and also being a part or partial uh, native Navajo. Um, I don't exactly uh, associate myself as being Indian, per se, and uh, this photo is actually my, my portrait that you'll see um, that will mark my, my time here at SAR. On my mother's side, I'm Irish and German, and on my father's side, I'm from Kewa Pueblo, and I'm Diné. Uh, this was always a, a very difficult thing for me to find an identity um, because uh, you know, I'm half native and half white, and uh, in between my native side, there is also a distinct um, separation of culture there. Uh, but <clears throat> I, I can't necessarily say that I am, um, I am a native person living in a native way. I am very much American. I grew up in America with the American system. And because of that, I've come to call myself Urban Indian. Now, this is a piece that I created that um, is making a lot of commentary on contemporary Native issues. The first, urban, um, constitutes you know being in an urban environment. It's shortened because, like I said, it's contemporary. We're in the days of texting and Twitter feeds. So everything is abbreviated, as well as Indian. Um, although I don't associate myself as being Indian, there's kind of a, a joke among us natives being N-D-N. So it's kind of just a, a little play on words, and also being from this day and age. It's something that I can, can uh, grasp and relate to. So this is the piece that was on my flyer. Um, this piece I created at the beginning, very beginning of my uh, residency, and it speaks about this, uh, this search for identity and the duality between being urban and being Indian. The figure on the right um, is using spray paint to paint the figure of clouds. Most of the time in native imagery from the southwest, clouds are an image used for happiness, but in this case, we have the clouds crying tears, partly because the medium of choice is spray paint, which is a toxic, flammable, um, non-recyclable material. Also, in his left hand, he holds a lollipop, which signifies the um, connection, but also the disconnection of corn um, with our contemporary native people. Um, corn syrup is the main ingredient in the candy that we love to eat. So um, the second piece I created was just an extension of this urban Indian. Um, um, I created a lot of work while I was here, but most of my time was actually spent doing research, being in the libraries uh, here at SAR and at MIAC, and also visiting with elders um, to talk about my issues uh, at hand. So um, the major part and, and a major issue in being urban is that um, 
ask, well, we all, we all know the issue. It's money. Um, although it's very necessary, um, this form of economy wasn't present in, in our, our, the history of our culture. But uh, this is the way that I grew up. I grew up with McDonald's and Happy Meals, um, Coca-Cola and corn syrup, as I mentioned, and being a, a child of technology age, uh, the information age, and also the media that has had a huge role on how I've projected, um, how I was projecting myself. Um, most of the roles that I kind of stuck with or found um, that I could relate to in the media were somewhat like this. This is Nightwolf from Mortal Kombat 2, I think. <laughs> um, you always see these sort of mythical heroes with powers, you know, uh, the wings of a soaring eagle, and um, this sort of indomitable stalker, tracker type. Um, this is mostly what I grew up on with images of being Indian. Um, but you also have this, too. Uh, this was the commercial that you probably saw where the Indian's crying on the side of the road and somebody dumps the trash and a tear rolls down his cheek. Well, that had a huge, that had a huge part in my life in that I got made fun of a lot for that. These things that happen in the media, they affect our everyday life. Um, here's another example from the Disney Channel. Very much a novelty Native American, but I cannot tell you how many times people quoted this movie, certain scenes from this movie, um, as a child growing up. And um, I started to realize ar around my 20s that this was not accurate and, and, and really owning up to my culture and realizing that there needs to be a change. So I decided that um, after pursuing a career of music, I would, uh, and, and my pursuits were in the West Coast, mostly LA and Las Vegas, Nevada, I decided I would move back to Santa Fe to reconnect with my roots. Obviously, um, feeling this disconnect of being an urban Indian. So I moved back to Santa Fe in order to figure out what it was. This is a very popular um, cartoon. I'm not sure of the artist, but I've seen it. A, a, it really says a lot about Santa Fe. Now, when I moved back to Santa Fe, this is not what happened. If, if anything, it was the opposite. This was the reason why I moved out of Santa Fe, was that I was really kind of just disgusted and so saturated with this Santa Fe style. Um, I, I had to get away with it, and that's why I left my home in pursuit of music in the West Coast. So I wanted to do things differently, and I wanted it to be authentic. I wanted it to be real. So I found myself at the Pole Cultural Center and Museum. Um, my father took classes here at the time, and he came home with an amazing belt buckle, sterling silver, hand stamped with turquoise. I said, where did, where did you get that, Dad? He said, I made this at class. And I was like, what? You made that? Okay, for sure, I've got to check this out. So I found myself in the Poe Arts Jewelry Studio. And it was really a, an amazing experience for me. Not only was I learning this traditional craft of, um, of my people, but I also was being um, introduced into a mix of Native cultures, which I really didn't get growing up in Santa Fe and, um, and moving out to the West Coast. I got to be among um, the descendants of Maria Martin Martinez, uh, the famed black-on-black -black potter, and um, other artists such as Carol Naranjo, who's a, a prominent figure in Santa Clara. And uh, here's my, a picture of my friend and teacher, Fritz Casus, who taught me silversmithing. I got to be in this sort of environment where we, we all got to share our culture, and many of us being from the Southwest, indigenous um, pueblos and tribes, it was really a, a good thing for me to, to be in contact with all these people, family members, really, and um, it had an effect on my art. 
I studied a traditional polychrome pottery from Sean Tafoya, who is also a SAR uh, fellow recipient. And um, he's the one that taught me a lot about my tradition when it comes to my Pueblo roots. Uh, this is called Pac Pot. It's Pac Man. <laughs> so, a little play on uh, kind of an ancient symbol that was used to kind of signify um, flowers or, or budding um, life. I also got to learn silversmithing and uh, create um, what, what came from the Spanish, but really was made into its own by the Navajo people. Um, this is sterling silver and, and turquoise from Colorado, Cripple Creek, Colorado. And this piece is called Strong Medicine. So I started to develop a style that was, um, even though this southwestern um, Santa Fe style was already just inherently in me, I started to really develop that. And I thought, you know, in this, in this day and age, in, in um, such a competitive art environment, um, you've got to be different. You've got to stand out. You've got to be unique um, in order to be successful. Um, so I thought, you know, why haven't I seen graffiti artists, people like me, um, that were um, youth, that were using the old traditions and creating something new and positive? Um, so I thought that would be my best ticket to success. And I started to create images that were very bold with subtle um, and sometimes not so subtle references to my culture in the Southwest of being Pueblo and Navajo. Um, the first side slide, this is Kiva Head. And I wanted to create a cartoon imagery that was really positive for natives. Um, you usually see red face, two braids, you know, big nose. I wanted to create something that was still cartoony, still fun, but had elements of Pueblo culture. Here's another I did of a buffalo dancer in the style of the Pueblo of Pewaukee. And another I did that's based on a, a turtle dance, a kachina, and a butterfly dancer. Um, now, when creating these, I thought that I was um, not overstepping my bounds on cultural, um, culturally sensitive issues. I felt that I was protecting enough and, and making it enough different to protect those uh, traditional ways. But it's a very um, complicated subject. Um, who, who owns Native culture, right? Um, what I've come to, f to understand, and I understand it the more that I get older, is that you don't actually own these, these images which have been used for thousands of years until you can actually say that you have taken whatever it is, you can wear it, you can put it on yourself, you can have it within your being and really know exactly what it means. Until you know that, you don't, you don't own a part of that. And so um, you're up for any kind of scrutiny or any kind of, um, really a lot of the times it's believed in our culture that the use of these symbols in a, in a wrong way can actually bring, bring you harm. So um, realizing this, I proposed to the IRC and the SAR um, this, this question. Obtaining an, IRA, an, excuse me, obtaining an IARC fellowship is important to me because I'm seeking to answer this question. How can I honor the unique stylized imagery of the indigenous Southwest in a way that respects the sacredness of my own cultural heritage and myself as an artist and as an individual? So basically, how can I draw from this amazingly unique and beautiful art but not threaten the traditional ways of using this art? Um, through the IARC collection and the SAR, I expect to gain a refinement of judgment and a fresh aesthetic perspective so that my art will come to honor my cultural heritage rather than threaten it. So how was I going to do this? Um, I had to figure out a medium, a place where people can all come together 
Although the Pueblo and the reservation life is guarded and is off on its own, there's one day, at least one day a year, where everybody is welcomed into the village, and that's feast day. Um, now I'm going to show a slide from another artist depicting a Pueblo feast day. This is David Bradley's piece. Um, now, I, I, li I love this painting, first of all, because it shows really when you go to a Pueblo feast day that you never know what to expect. <laughs> you never know who you're going to sit next to or uh, who you'll be in the company of, but it will always be different. Um, you see all sorts of nationalities, races, um, you know, genders, ages, and uh, all different types of food. Um, as described by the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center, feast days at each of the Pueblos are named after the Pueblo's patron saint. The Pueblos open up their respective feast days to the public, where visitors can view the reverent dances and songs offered on those days. Feast days bring tribal members together to renew their culture, language, and native religion. On those days, families prepare food for the many invited visitors coming through their homes and participate in the activities taking place on their feast day. Pueblo feast day dates do not change and are held on the same day each year. So this is, if you don't uh, know what a feast day is, this is basically, basically it. Um, so I started looking um, in the libraries at um, the way that we have always feasted. And I picked up this book. It's called Identity, Feasting, and the Archaeology of the Greater Southwest, edited by Bar Barbara J. Mills. It's a collection of um, archaeological works um, to address the title. Um, so one thing is for sure that they found um, in every feasting um, situation is that there was always an emphasis of quality and quantity. So in this book, it's a little, a little weird for me to, to read it because they're trying to figure out what a feast is in like archaeological terms. And that's just kind of really backwards for me. But anyways, there's a lot of food and it's really good food. It usually depends on um, season and, um, and location of what was being eaten. Uh, there's always an emphasis of sharing. In fact, uh, this method of feeding um, almost susses out any sort of economical hierarchy within community. Um, they also found that feast days served as a model for the household. So um, in feeding and bringing, welcoming people into your house and the, sort of the ritual that comes along with that, it was served as a model for the way that you would treat your family. Um, so that's basically where I started in my research, and it kind of led me to thinking of, um, of looking more heavily into the old ways of feasting. Now today, this is a particular um, meal from a feast that is not uncommon. In fact, you'd be pretty pumped if you got a meal like this. Um, here we have the delicious pile of Jemez style enchiladas. It's a flour tortilla with cheese, onions, smothered in red chili. We have Pueblo bread or horno bread, oven bread, a potato salad, a tamale, and you can see off in the corner there's a bowl of red chili right there. Um, in looking and visiting, um, in visiting Pueblo feast days and looking at the food that was at the table, it was clear right away that I knew, at least from the, the produced foods, that this is not the way that we've always eaten. And so I wanted to examine that. Um, one of the people that is leading this, um, this sort of investigation of the Puebloan pre-contact diet is Roxanne Swensel from Santa Clara Pueblo. She asks, what was your original diet? Meaning, looking at your ancestors, what did they eat? She started up the Flowering Tree Permaculture Institute, along with natives um, from other Pueblos, uh, Tezuke in, in particular. 
um, to start this uh, institute that would not only um, be focused on seed saving, but also be focused in uh, preserving traditional food ways. Um, there's a lot to be said about traditional food ways. Um, I guess mainly corn is our staple food. Alongside that, it really um, is beneficial to the plant to grow alongside beans and squash. Um, other foods that we ate usually depended on how, how much meat there was, but most of it was, uh, was dried foods, uh, cornmeal, beans, um, berries, and uh, this diet is really actually sustainable and healthy. Um, Roxanne has been said that uh, kind of what has always marked our survival as humans was being energy efficient. And this diet and this farming technique of farming corn, beans, and squash is incredibly efficient. I mean, that's really the only way that Pueblo peoples survived in the desert with dry farming for so long. Um, so it is, it is what us desert people, what we've been attuned to in our bodies in order to be healthy um, human beings. Um, on another side of the spectrum, there's sort of this food activism. And it's a passive activism in that you're really only being an activist in that you change your lifestyle of eating by um, resorting to your old wit, traditional ways of, of feeding. Uh, it's almost like winning a battle between yourself and the corporate packaged food. So um, one example of a food activist is Claudia Servata. Or I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Claudia Serrato. Indigenous veganism, the first public platica given by the founders of Decolonial Food for Thought. So this really um, turned my perspective and even actually made me um, make subtle, subtle changes in my diet. I've become less of a meat eater, more towards the vegetarian side, but it's, as you all know, it's very hard. We're addicted. We are addicted. But um, I'm going to share with you a clip of Claudia's um, uh, radio, radio um, interview that really changed my way of thinking. Our communities are ill. And when I speak of communities, I don't speak of you, me. Yes, I do, but there's more. When I speak of communities, I speak of the earth. I speak of the land. I speak of, you know, are the animals. I speak of, you know, the environment, the ecosystem. And our communities are really ill right now. Our communities are very, very ill because as the Chicana and Chicano nation, we have adopted a colonial diet. And, and the reason why I say that our communities are ill is because one, by this, um, what is it, the, the way they process food? Um, assembly line, right? They have an assembly line for, for, these, for these animals. And I mean, it is just total disrespect. And as indigenous people, we did not disrespect life forms. These life forms are disrespected. I mean, you're talking about, and not just that. Again, you know, I did mention that, you know, I'm a feminista, right? I mean, we're talking about female bodies. We're talking about female cows, female chicken. These are women's bodies, you know? And we also talk about, oh, the liberation of women, the liberation of women, equal rights. Well, like for me, as a Chicana feminist indígena, that's very, very important is that my liberation is not complete until the liberation of animals are complete. Because when the liberation of animals are complete, then the liberation of land is complete. And the reason why I say that is because to feed just the, the dairy cows that we have today, which are female bodies, you know, milk producing women, females, um, it takes 80% of our water sources to grow the grain to feed these animals that are going to be slaughtered to feed us that get us sick from these diseases. So I'll stop it right there. Um, obviously very, very moving and powerful statements from Claudia. Um, this was kind of the mind, mindset 
that I was in, in, in my creation process and prepping for that. Um, now, she, she mentioned this, uh, this uh, using 80% of our water source to grow the grain. The grain is corn. And um, it's interesting because we're feeding this grain, which is an old world food, to new world animals, livestock. Um, to look at a chart, the 2011 corn usage in the U.S., this is provided by the National Corn Growers Association. 36% um, of our corn is for feed and residual, and another, uh, basically splitting this chart in half almost, is um, for fuel, ethanol. Um, corn has become our, our cash crop, and... Um, you can see uh, you know, on the other sections of the chart, we have sweeteners, corn syrup, um, alcoholic beverages, starches. It's really, um, the, our, our plant, this sacred plant has really come a long way in um, being used for, for reasons that, to be quite frankly, aren't sacred at all. Um, this yellow dent corn is uh, the corn that is used for feed. It's also used for corn syrup. And 97 million acres of yellow dent corn were grown in the U.S. in 2011. And it takes approximately 4,000 to 5,000 gallons of water to grow one bushel of corn. 12.36 billion bushels of corn were grown in 2011. So if you think about it that way, so much water is going in to this cash crop. And it, it, you know, our corn, it was never like this. Our techniques of farming were natural. We didn't, um, we didn't have pollution. In, in all of this um, overproduced corn, we get leaks into our water systems where nutrients and pesticides infiltrate our water systems. And um, just looking at the effects that corn has on, on the livestock, uh, the figure on the left is a GMO-fed pig, and that's the stomach. It's swollen, it's irritated, and it, it doesn't look healthy at all, but the one on the right is a control pig. It was fed scraps and food, and the traditional foods that a pig would eat. Um, fructose, it goes right to the liver and triggers lipogenesis, the production of fats like the triglycerides and cholesterol. This is why it is a major cause of liver damage in this country. This corn isn't, isn't built for our bodies. It really isn't. Um, it came from this grass. This is teosinte. And um, archaeological evidence suggests that it came from Mexico and that early farmers began to, uh, through selection process, hybridize corn into the plant that we have today. And you can see just beautiful, beautiful corn. Um, they hybridized it to make the cob thicker. Certain um, kernels were kept for sweetness. Certain kernels were kept for color. Um, and what we get today, what we, the corn that we eat is white sweet corn. This is generally what you'll get from the store or in any canned goods or frozen packages. Um, it took, or we had 260,000 acres of farmland for this white sweet corn every year. And um, I believe the number for yellow dent corn is 86, or around 90 million acres. So um, as you can see, this has a huge effect on our environment. Not to mention, all this grain is going to feed livestock, which livestock increase, increases CO2 emissions greater than uh, that of automobile transport. It's just the, the, the economic footprint that growing yellow dent corn for livestock feed is incredible, and it's, it's very staggering. Um, there was a time when we kind of resisted this government infrastructure, this government way of eating. Um, definitely during the Pueblo Revolt, when, uh, when the Pueblos regained control, um, they, they banned all New World foods, um, in, including livestock. So that was probably one of the early, earliest times. But I began to think, well, I wonder if there was anybody 
you know, that I can talk to among these elders that know about any sort of resistance. The elders I spoke to, they're usually war era um, in age. And um, it was very interesting talking with elders in that they shared stories of resistance. Um, during the time of, um, of these wars, the veterans were coming home and bringing with them these um, ideas of amenities, you know, electricity, running water. And um, when they were introduced into the Pueblos, there was actually, there have been stories of, of um, Pueblo members resisting this infrastructure. I've heard stories of grandmothers laying down in the middle of the road to keep uh, bulldozers from tearing up the land to bring in electric lines. And uh, there's also been stories of water lines that were installed being knocked down by Pueblo elders. So I thought it was very interesting that these elders still have these stories of when these sort of uh, infrastructure in our everyday life was first introduced. And um, I thought what was very interesting is that this era when, when infrastructure was being introduced is the same era of the studio period Pueblo paintings. So um, I'm going to start getting into my creation process. So I, I started looking at the IARC collection of Pueblo paintings, and they have an extensive collection, thousands of paintings in the Pueblo style. Most of them um, have common traits. Um, and you can see it. This is another example on the wall done by Awatsire. Um, this is also Awatsire's piece. She's from a, an artist from San Ildefonso. Um, usually it was uh, very stylized in this sort of uh, cropping off the corners and having this earth basically a line signifying earth and sky and other uh, symbols that have been used in ritual Pueblo paintings. Here's another example. So you start to see in looking at these paintings, thousand paintings, you'll notice that as far as subject matter goes, it really only pertains to um, ceremonies, some acts of everyday life like farming or it would show women cooking. Um, this was the only single only picture I could find of a Pueblo person just kind of relaxing and fishing. It, I mean, he's not hunting, but it looks like he's enjoying himself. And so uh, I started to think about that. Well, you know, clearly from talking to these elders, there was a lot going on back at home. And they weren't necessarily painting, painting that. So the creation begins. I wanted to give a voice for, for the Pueblo people in that there, there wasn't always just ceremonial paintings. There wasn't just farming. There was a lot going on there. And um, it really adds to the dimension of, of our people that we're not just this idealized version of Pueblo people. We actually are real people dealing with, um, you know, struggles that we're actually still dealing with today. So the creation begins. I wanted to start, first of all, in making this Pueblo piece. I wanted there to be an emphasis on character design. A lot of the characters that you saw in the Pueblo paintings, they were very simple. Um, they were not... Um, personalized at all. So I wanted to do that for my painting. I wanted each character to have their own individualism and um, an imagined individualism, I should say. So I start out drawing a sketch with a marker and with tracing paper, I perfect my sketch until I'm pretty happy with it. So this would be an elder, a Pueblo elder, and um, he's designed in the, uh, the fashion of his time. Uh, this would be another Pueblo elder representing the other Kiva. 
And I wanted to have that as a uh, representation of the traditional ways. Here we have um, what I, this character is a soldier. It is a veteran soldier. As you can see, he sports the sort of like G.I. Joe scar on his face. So he's actually seen battle. He's been to war, he's come back. And he's, in, he's the one that has helped to introduce these ideas of infrastructure into the Pueblo. Here we have another um, a Pueblo person, but this time, it, um, this is the, resist, the resistance to infrastructure. He's yielding an ax. And uh, we take these characters, we put them in an environment, and this is kind of what it looks like. Now, part of my proposal was to also um, utilize technology and newer technology to help me with my, um, with my piece, the execution of my piece. So I rendered this image digitally so that I could drop colors in, change things, move things around, add things, basically figure out this style of Pueblo painting. Um, have it figured out before I go to the canvas because this is not my style. I've never done this, and in fact, I've never executed um, watercolors at all up until this point. And uh, traditionally, Pueblo period paintings were all done in watercolors. So I had a lot of work cut out for me, and I wanted to make sure it was done right. Here's more evolution of the piece. And finally, we come to uh, the work which I title Outside In. And this is the piece that I will be donating to the collection in SAR. And um, it is watercolor on watercolor paper. And um, it's done in the Pueblo style. Um, I, uh, it, I, I guess I'll just talk a little bit about the piece um, in executing it. Um, it was really difficult. Like I said, I had never done watercolor. To keep this canvas so clean and white, there's so much white space, was really a struggle for me. I'm a graffiti artist. I'm used to paint splatter and messiness. This was not that. So every day I came in, I cleaned up myself, put my hair back, put on a lab coat, and went to work. I tried to imagine myself being one of these students in an Indian school with a white teacher telling me how to, how to paint. So this was kind of my approach to it. So um, we have in the classical style, the earth represented by the uh, bar on the bottom. The um, black sort of stepped figures represent the emergence. Um, they go right into the water pump. And this water pump was actually created by a splash of blue paint that wasn't supposed to be there. Um, I had to hide that. So that's how this <laughs> pump came to be, actually. It, 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 in design, looked very much different. But um, it is mechanically, and like, like if you're an engineer, you could probably see that this would work. It's a pump that draws up water from the ground. Um, from the, uh, on the outsides, still on the earth, you see uh, two corn plant, plants. And this represents the future generations um, from there, on the outside, you can see this double rainbow. Um, it didn't start out as a double rainbow. It started out as a single rainbow. Um, I, I did it. It was really hard. Straight lines are just very difficult. But I got it on there. I was happy. And then I realized that in our atmosphere, rainbows don't exist with red being on the bottom and blue being on the top. It's just impossible, unless it's a double rainbow. So I looked out somehow, I threw in the second rainbow, added in the clouds, and it really came together kind of nicely. But um, anyways, the point of the piece is to show that even though we have, you know, um, this sort of impression of what Pueblo life really was, there is an untold story of Pueblo life that may actually help us in the future to, um, to look at our infrastructure, our ways of dealing with the planet 
Um, these elders were giving us a distinct message in that as soon as man is cut off from his sacred life source, there's a, a sacred connection broken in our bodies, in our minds, and in our spirits. So I wanted to honor that and show that there's wisdom still there in these pueblos today. And their message today is that we revert back to growing our foods. Um, for a long time, for all of mankind, we we're dependent upon the seeds. You put seeds in my hand, I can take those seeds, I can grind them up, make cornmeal, and I can feed the spirits of the past. Take those seeds, I can grind them up, make tortillas, feed my people now. And I can take those seeds and save them and feed my people in the future. Okay, but if, if I was to give most people in this audience a handful of seeds, most people wouldn't know what to do with them and wouldn't be able to feed their families in the future. On the other hand, if I was to give you a $100 bill, put that in your hand, I guarantee you, you'll know exactly how to feed, feed your people. So this is the message that we've see, received from our Pueblo elders, and um, this is the work that, that I will continue to make. Um, I think we're about to wrap it up. There's one more piece. This is a little bit... Uh, it's a little bit me, a little bit traditional, a little bit... It's the urban Indian again. Uh, and uh, I guess I'll close out with a video that I created also while being here on the, in residency that um, I think speaks a lot about being an urban Indian. Um, before I do that, we'll close with the video. So before I do that, I just want to express one more time my thanks, my gratitude... To, first of all, my parents for bringing me here into this world, for the pole arts, for really um, cradling me in, in, develop, in, in growing up and developing as an artist. And I want to thank SAR for this opportunity, um, uh, which is a life-changing one. So thank you. Yeah.